get started. Again, welcome to everyone who's joined us. Wonderful to see over 100 people here to learn more about citizens assemblies. Um, my name is Anita Nickerson. I'm the executive director of Fair Vote Canada. And if there's anybody here that's new to Fair Vote Canada, we're a national citizens campaign for proportional representation. We have been around for about 20 years now. And I'm going to start this webinar with a land acknowledgement. Uh, I am in Kitch I live in Kitchener, Ontario. So I'd like to start by acknowledging that I am on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee people. We honor their stewardship, past, present, and future. And we recognize that they have lived here for over 15,000 years and that we share this territory in a space of peace, friendship, and respect. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to be starting with a very short presentation on citizens assemblies, just to if this is a totally new topic to you just to bring you up to speed on a sort of a 101 that should take me oh hopefully no more than five to 10 minutes. Then I'm going to invite each of our guests that are joining us today to spend about 10 minutes um, presenting verbally to you about what they came here to talk about. And before uh, I have each one come on, I'll introduce them with their biographies. So you can see here that we have Graham Allen, Shoney Field, and Michael Johns. So I will just uh, invite the speakers to turn off their webcams and I will pull up my presentation. After the presentations by all the guests are over, we will have about 45 minutes for Q&A. And that's when I'll bring back all our guests and you can put all your questions in the question and answer box and we'll try to get to as many of those as we can. So I'm going to be sharing my screen now. Okay, and I'm going to put this into present mode. So I'm assuming everybody can see can see this presentation. Can somebody just yeah. let Gisela know? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it looks good. Okay, super. All right. So again, welcome. I already introduced myself in Fair Vote Canada. Here are some of our wonderful volunteers in Toronto. And we are going to be talking today about citizens assemblies. And so I'm going to introduce why Fair Vote Canada is advocating for a national citizens assembly on electoral reform as the next step, as compared to, for example, uh, another all party committee on its own or the referendum. So what is a citizens assembly? So a citizens assembly is a body of citizens formed to deliberate on an important policy issue. And it's really based on the belief that when you give ordinary people the knowledge, the resources, and the time, they can find solutions to complex, challenging, and controversial issues. So it really puts a lot of faith in the power of people. Because citizens' assemblies are representative of the public, and because they're so, so trustworthy, they're, the things they recommend are likely to be seen as a legitimate expression of the public will. So who sits on a citizens assembly? And this is one of the first questions that we always get when somebody says citizens assemblies because the first thing that comes to mind is that some political party was gonna handpick a bunch of their friends to sit on. I mean, we've all seen that, right? A citizens assembly is designed not to be like that. A citizens assembly is basically a mini public. It's as close as you can reasonably get to a group that looks just like us. So the citizens are selected, but like a jury is selected in a way, except for it's stratified to ensure that there are equal numbers of men and women. And it can be it can be stratified so that you have ensure that you have people from every region across the country, ensure that you have a range of ages, a range of educations, that kind of thing. But in general, people are selected in, like a, a lottery process. So tens of thousands of letters would go out across the country uh, to people on the voters roll and people who respond will be randomly picked uh, to sit on the assembly so that you get a group of people who are not informed already about the issue. It's not people from a special interest group or a party. It's people that are interested in doing civic service for their fellow citizens. And also it's important that since participation in the citizens assembly can be quite lengthy, it can go for up to a year uh, and it's voluntary that people should be compensated in some way. So 
that it makes it easier for people to say yes, people who have kids at home, uh, you know, small kids at home, people that uh, maybe would have to take some time off work um, to, to spend all their weekends deliberating with fellow citizens. So those expenses need to be paid so that you get a representative group. So what happens on the Citizens Assembly? Well, the Citizens Assembly is there to learn from the evidence. So they do consultations uh, where they'll go out in communities and hear from the public. And those hearings are part of their deliberations. They also hear from stakeholders who will come in and present to them. For example, Fair Vote Canada would come in and present to a Citizens Assembly, as would people on the other side of the issue. Um, they'll hear from all kinds of experts and they'll have the ability to invite experts uh, that they want to learn more from to come back. So they're able to, in a large part, drive their own process. And then they spend a lot of time learning and deliberating with each other so they can weigh the evidence and really thoroughly talk things through. Usually citizens assemblies come to a consensus. So this doesn't necessarily mean that it's unanimous, but often it's close to unanimous because they take the time to work through their differences and come to something that they feel reflects the common interest. So a citizens assembly can be commissioned by the government. And I, I'll talk a little bit in a minute about why that's the ideal scenario. But it's run by an independent nonpartisan body that specializes in deliberative processes. So Fair Vote Canada wouldn't be running a citizens assembly. Obviously, we wouldn't be seen as impartial and unbiased. Right. So a citizen and the same with the government and the same with political parties. So the, the role of the government is to ensure that the, the assembly is fully funded and to show leadership, but it really needs to be independent and nonpartisan. That's part of what gives it credibility. And here you're looking at a picture of the BC Citizens Assembly. Thank you to Shoni for all the wonderful pictures she sent me a couple of years ago that we've made very good use of. <laughs> So in Canada, the company that runs most citizens assemblies is called Mass LBP, and they've actually run hundreds of processes for various levels of government and for other organizations. And they have actually run processes for our federal government, even though in that in sometimes those processes weren't very well publicized. So again, they have no stake in the outcome either way. Their specialization is running deliberative democracy processes. So what is the role of the government then? Uh, the, go the role of the government is to, one, fully publicize the assembly. So I think we had the experience here in Ontario of having a pretty good citizens assembly oh, about almost 20 years ago now that nobody knew was happening. So that's what we don't want because that shows a lack of political leadership. And I'm sure we could go down a rabbit hole talking about that. But government leadership is key. It's so that people know that there is this group of people working on their behalf. So to publicize that this is happening requires a significant amount of resources. And the Citizens Assembly will make sure that anybody who wants to closely follow along with their work can do so. So I wanted to refer quickly to a 2020 report by the OECD. Uh, and they looked at 279 processes like this. Now, not necessarily all citizens assemblies. Uh, that some of them were smaller processes. Uh, you know, in Canada, we call those reference panels. So the citizens assembly model of the randomly selected group can work on a small scale, medium scale, or the largest scale, which is the citizens assembly. But it all follows the same model. So they looked at 279 of these processes around the world and just looked at how well are they working? What are they being used on? What are best practices, basically? And so this is like a wonderful um, introduction to these processes. And I wanted to pull out a few things that relate specifically uh, to electoral reform in terms of what they recommended. So they found that citizens assemblies deliver better policy outcomes from informed citizen judgments rather than public opinion. And it sort of took me a while to get, what are they talking about? What they're talking about is an informed opinion rather than uh, the kind of opinion you get at a, a referendum where it's largely based on what somebody's party told them to do or some advertisement they saw or a total lack of information, you know, in citizens assembly, you're getting what would the average person think if they actually had time to sit and learn and, and debate this. 
so the, again, you get greater legitimacy to make hard choices. So on, on topics where it's really hard for the government to move ahead, but they want to move ahead, a, a citizens assembly will give them what they need to be able to do that. It enhances public trust by giving citizens an effective role in decision making. It makes government more inclusive to a diverse group of people. And it ensures a citizens assembly because it's totally independent, ensures people with money and power can't have an undue influence on a public decision. Another thing a citizens assembly does that's really important in today's day and age, probably a lot more important than it was even 20 years ago, is citizens assemblies are processes that can help counteract uh, and just basically overcome polarization and misinformation. So it's really an environment where people are not politically polarized and they're not being subjected to a bunch of misinformation. So around the world, citizens assemblies, the use of them is growing. So, you know, if you look at, you know, 20 years ago, these weren't used very much. BC was sort of revolutionary. It sort of started the ball rolling in the world for using these. And over the last few years, they are really taking off. They were used in Ireland, not just on abortion, which is the most well-known example of how Ireland uses citizens assembly to get past that decades long political impasse. But they've also been used in Ireland to look at climate change policy, to look at gender equality. Um, there was one in the UK on climate change, in France on climate change, really interesting example around the government leadership sort of piece there. Um, the, it, there was one last year on the future of Scotland. Uh, in Australia, they had a huge citizens assembly looking at uh, nuclear waste and uh, where to store it. In Germany, there was uh, one run by an independent group used to lobby the government on democracy. And in a part of Belgium, they've established a permanent citizens assembly that uh, the members, not rotate, but there's different members that are selected periodically and they examine issues that are important to people and then they make recommendations to the government. So again, the use of these is increasing and increasing and there's lots of success stories now. So when do you want to hold a deliberative process? Well, you want to do it according to the OECD report when you have value driven dilemmas, when you have complex problems that require trade-offs, and that when you have a long-term issue that goes beyond the short-term incentives of electoral cycles. So just to sort of, uh, you can probably see how that might relate to electoral reform without me having to explain it too much, but here's the simplification of it, okay? Why would the turkeys plan an early Thanksgiving? So when people say, well, why don't you just have the politicians just do it? Why, why do we spend all this time promoting more processes? It's because the politicians, whether they're well-meaning or not, are in a conflict of interest, particularly on this issue because it's all about power. And on a very personal level, it's about their riding boundaries. It's about how they're elected. So we have been having uh, committees on electoral reform in Canada now this is uh, the cover of the report from 1921 of the special committee on PR that was uh, appointed by the Liberal government after a promise to bring in PR. So we're rightfully skeptical of a committee process on its own after 100 years of broken promises. So in the last three years, Fairville Canada has been promoting the use of citizens assemblies quite a lot. And last year we commissioned a national poll. Uh, we had Leger, which is Canada's largest marketing and polling company, do a poll asking people what they thought about this idea. And what we found is that across Canada, citizens were extremely supportive of the idea of a national citizens assembly on electoral reform. And across every party, voters were supportive of the idea of a National Citizens Assembly on electoral reform, which just basically says that people like this idea of putting this in the hands of their fellow citizens, and that when there is political leadership, there will be public support. So that is all from me. And I am going to invite on, have I st stopped sharing my screen? I have a feeling I didn't. You stopped. Did I? Oh, okay, great. All right. So I'm going to invite on our first guest. 
uh, which is Graham Allen. And I'm going to read you Graham's bio, which I find is pretty fascinating and a little bit uh, different from some of our usual guests. And he has some really practical, real world experience and advice to offer to us. So Graham represented the UK constituency of Nottingham North as its MP in the UK from 1987 to 2017. So that's 30 years. Um, he was his party's spokesperson in parliament in eight different policy fields. Uh, he served as the government whip to the deputy prime minister for five years. And he tells us that he is a recovering whip for those of us <laughs> who would like to see a little less of the strict party discipline that we have in Canada. It's very strict. Graham's ambition is to turn the UK into a modern democracy. In 2010, he was elected by parliamentary colleagues in a secret ballot to be the chair of the new political and constitutional reform select committee. It worked to produce a raft of reports on redeveloping a modern democracy. As a, quote, very independent minded MP, Graham organized the two biggest parliamentary rebellions within a governing party in the UK's political history. <laughs> uh, he stepped down in 2017, and part of the reason that he did that was to focus on the creation of a citizens convention on UK democracy. So Graham is going to talk about process and not policy, which is really a passion of his, and why he's pushing for a citizens convention in the UK. He's also going to talk about how his 30 years of experience in one of the two main political parties in the UK has shaped his approach, why he's decided that this is the path to go for democratic reform in general, in contrast to other methods. So I'm going to turn it over to Graham. Thank you so much for joining us, Graham. Anita, thank you so much for inviting me and uh, thank you for the inspiration from so many Canadians on, on this issue. Um, Peter McLeod is a name that springs to mind immediately as someone that's been very influential uh, on me, but uh, there, there are many others, uh, pioneers from Canada. Um, I want to really be provocative and say initially, no one should see uh, deliberative democracy and particularly citizen assemblies as a weapon by which they can achieve their own campaigning aims. This is a different way of doing politics. And you know, it may actually not produce the outcome that you want. It's producing an outcome that a microcosm of the population speak up on, uh, on behalf of everybody else in the population. So it's something that we think could actually carry across the whole country. So that's why saying, unless it delivers this for me, I'm gonna go home and sulk in a corner is not the way to deal with citizens assemblies. You've got to get in, you have to make your case if you are campaigning for one thing or another, and then citizens impartially can make that decision. It's even bigger than that now, actually. Uh, in the last three or four years, it's become evident to anyone who cares to think about this, that there is a battle about to start, indeed has started, between democracy and autocracy. And we need to make sure that citizens' assemblies work because they will be one of the strongest defences for our democracy, evolving our democracy and taking it forward. So even beyond that, citizens' assemblies have moved from a, a tool to resolve policy issues right to the heart of saving our democracy as a whole. It demonstrates our democracy can be better than the elitist version that many of us have seen in our own countries, uh, entertaining populism and being very, very complacent and for representatives getting into good positions and then pulling up the, the ladder uh, and distancing themselves effectively from an effective process to listen to people. So I don't think our democracy, democracies are fit for purpose let alone fit for the battle that is going to come very, very seriously and is already with some of our democratic nations. So we need to maintain, uh, by that I mean uh, polish and cherish and move forward uh, our democracy so that it's actually um, going to be fit for that fight ahead. If he's not given, it's not just that's the way we've always done stuff. Democracy is a living organism which should involve everybody 
and citizens' assemblies is one of the best ways, if not the best way, uh, to engage a broader section of the population. I also want to try and be provocative and move the debate a little bit from methodology to hard politics. It was really important over the last five or 10 years that we got the methodology right. And Anita, you pointed to the OECD report, which was a brilliant summation of all the good stuff that there is a good way, a what works way of looking at citizens assemblies. Uh, that's great. But you know, now we've got to go beyond that and we've got to get into rolling up our sleeves and fighting alongside those people who have political power, we think, and they are the representatives that we elect to our various legislatures. And I say that with the caveat because um, I was a member of parliament for 30 years and it, only in government did I even remotely exercise power. As a member of the legislature, I always say that being in Westminster was like being on the uh, British equivalent of Robin Island, where you've got a lot of politically minded people locked away out of mischief and government was getting on meanwhile and running the country. So let's try to see how we can partner with representative democracy and the representatives with the bulk of our citizens, rather than blaming one group or another or one party or one group of people in our political spectrum. We must use citizens assemblies to reunite politically uh, elected representatives with our citizens. And that might make us all quite uncomfortable because it will mean people who are mistrusting of each other, who are cynical about each other, actually giving the other side a bit of a chance again and saying, look, if we don't work together, governments will continue to run our democracies, governments will continue not to listen, and our democracies themselves uh, will be threatened. And I think really interesting is recent polling data, particularly the stuff from Pew, which actually looks at the population and citizens as being much more in tune with what you might term uh, a, a non-extreme position. I think if you look at the United States, where the elected representatives barely speak to each other other than to send abusive uh, tweets or, com or cartoons of killing each other, as has happened recently. And the people in the middle, the citizens, actually, they've got quite a similar view on police reform, uh, infrastructure building, social care, uh, how you um, maintain a, an effective economy. And it's oddly the so-called representatives who are now walking away from that or distance from that, getting everybody back together again, rather than taking sides in a divisive fight has got to be the way to do that. And that includes if you are an ardent supporter of one party doing what I had to do, and that is talking very closely with part of people from the other side of the aisle, if you if you want to use that expression. So that's important for us. It's also important for a global outcome for democracy. People in countries throughout the world are looking at what's next here. They're looking at if you're a person uh, in power in a country that isn't yet a democracy, or you're a people who have a person in power and being told what to do by that person, you want, you have wanted traditionally democracy to win out. But if democracy isn't delivering, if democracy is seen by people to be a bit of a fraud, then they will be seduced more easily by autocrats and populists. So it's important that we get this right for everybody, uh, not just ourselves. So you mentioned, Anita, policy versus process. So I was the original policy guy, the Jim Carey uh, policy man, if you like, uh, throughout 30 years in the House of Commons. And it took me that length of time to figure out that actually how you get to implement that policy is at least as important as the policy itself. And so process is really important. And just before coming on air with you, we had a very brief discussion 
about how you would do that. And um, I think it's Anita made a very good presentation on the mechanics of how you could uh, use a, a better process to actually get towards a more consensual view on policy. But I'm concerned about ensuring that we involve the political classes, I told you this would be hard, involve the political classes from the outset, not, not in the meeting, uh, not in the convention itself, but on what the agenda might be, what the issues are, uh, what they commit to at each stage of the process, rather than what many of us have done, uh, which is to go away, produce a lovely report, we all like it, and then land it on gov government's desk and they're surprised the government then doesn't pick it up and deal with it. So making those connections, how will this move forward? What are you prepared to do? Will you allow our people to come in and talk directly to government? Uh, will we be in front of a, a cabinet level subcommittee uh, to discuss how this is taken forward? Well before any reports are published. So it's, that's what I meant by hard politics, being really serious about that rather than waiting to the end and using the narrative of, oh, we've been betrayed, when in fact we hadn't sought to engage with people from the outset. So partnership is one of the processes, not uh, division. This is a process that has the advantage of coming into politics from the outside. So it can start, as Anita said, with this almost clean sheet. Uh, and as they proved in Ireland, even the most difficult issue, abortion, which was off limits to all political parties for 60 years, they managed to get consent of the structures of the legislature and government as that process developed and changed the law on an issue that no one ever thought was possible. The process must be trusted and independent. Um, it must be seen and pitched as being as significant as votes for all was over 150 years, that it's going to be that big. This is such a potentially big change in the way that we do business. It doesn't abolish representative democracy. It makes it work as someone who was in an institution like that for many, many years. So part of how it all works just briefly on the methodology, Jim Fishkin sums it up in the phrase democracy in good conditions. So all those things that Anita talked about in terms of making sure people go to a decent hotel, that they have childcare, that they have transport costs, et cetera, and, and decent meals, et cetera, uh, so that they feel a part of this process. And going beyond that is also very important, not just the hundred or so people in the room, but making sure that uh, millions, I actually, in my document that I uh, pitched to the Prime Minister of Britain a year ago, um, um, a year ago last month, um, was actually talking exactly about that. How do you get millions of founding mothers and fathers of your new constitutional settlement or your review of electoral processes? Um, I believe that uh, artificial intelligence has great examples being developed right now by Jim Fishkin, but also by people in the UK, where you, instead of trying to employ 5,000 facilitators or 10,000 moderators, you can actually use, and they are demonstrating how you can engage anybody who's prepared to deliberate. This is not yes and no black, white issues. This is, um, uh, and enabling people to engage in that process as a, as a part of feeding in to that core group of 100. So um, I think I better wind up now, but just say that a couple of things that I would finish on is, I hope that we can all work together and I hope that you'll become part of making sure that that work that the OECD did is actually taken wider so that we have a what works organization across the planet which can facilitate honestly and uh, without uh, partiality, lots more citizens assemblies, in fact, making them a feature of our democratic culture right the way around the world. I, as a former politician and uh, member of parliament, would love to see every bill 
that is presented to the parliament go through a six week process of a citizens assembly. Then we would actually know what people outside thought and it would give that possibility of finding things that could unite people rather than having uh, votes which are purely and rigidly on party lines. So there's a lot more to say, but I'm conscious of my time, but I just want to say thank you for organizing the event today. I think it is really important. And I think everyone, everyone will be following your success, I hope, in pulling together um, a national level assembly uh, for a proper examination of voting systems in Canada. Because if you can do that, we are all looking and we'll take great strength from the fact that you do that. So more power to you in what you're doing. And thank you again for inviting me along this evening. Thanks, Graham. That was wonderful. And I, I really want to sort of um, reiterate what Graham was saying. So in Fair Vote, because we're a single issue organization, right? It's like we're looking at it as a um, related to our issue. Graham is situating us in a bigger, a much bigger context, you know, of saying that this is citizens assemblies and their use on all issues is part of the saving democracy isn't quite the right transforming democracy so that it can evolve and continue and do better in the years ahead rather than the way we're all concerned that it's going so we are just one little piece but we're connected to a bigger whole of people across the world that are trying to do this exact same thing on every level so thank you so much graham for for that it was wonderful and i'll look forward to uh talking to you more in the q a so i'm going to introduce shoni so shoni field uh can give us more of a personal perspective, which is wonderful. You know, so Shoni was one of the randomly selected members of the BC Citizens Assembly on electoral reform in 2004. Since then, she's been committed to electoral reform, citizens assemblies, and voter engagement, and she's had quite a few roles, uh, the co-chair, and she was media spokesperson for the Citizens Assembly alumni group from 2004 to 2008. She was a board member of Fair Voting BC from 2005 to 2009. She was the provincial spokesperson and campaign exec for BC citizens for STV in 2009. She was president of Fair Vote Canada's board. Uh, 2010 to 2013 so there was like a, a overlap there where I came in and Shoni was our president seems like so long ago um, she was co-founder of 123 Vancouver for two years and she was a member of Vancouver's independent election task force in 2016 and 2019 which recommended a citizens assembly for the city of Vancouver to examine electoral reform in Vancouver and professionally she has been a fundraiser for nonprofits for 20 years and she is BC SPCA's chief development officer so with that i'm really happy to welcome shoni thanks anita it's a pleasure to be here today i want to take a, a second uh, just uh, before i talk about what i want to talk about uh, to acknowledge uh, those of my fellow british Columbians who are on today who are impacted by floods and or their communities are cut off uh, we're seeing uh, a lot of extreme weather here in in bc this year and i know it's had a huge impact on my fellow citizens so I'm going to take the time today to talk about a bit about what we did as a Citizens Assembly. It's quite a long time ago now, uh, how we did our work, what were some of the criticisms of us as a Citizens Assembly, uh, what the outcome was from what we did, uh, what I see as some of the benefits, and the sort of conclusions I've drawn over the years around what would be conditions for success for a Citizens Assembly. So first of all, looking at the context that we, um, the Citizens Assembly came into being, we were coming after two of the more dramatically flawed, like more than usual dramatically flawed elections in that we had a wrong winner in BC, followed them by the defeat of a government um, that brought them down to an opposition 
of, of two parties. And so we had a pan-partisan understanding amongst voters that something was broken. And that was a really important condition because we do depend on some political will to bring official citizens assemblies into being. And so having that pan-partisan voter understanding that we need to fix this definitely helps set the context for us. We had 160 160 members. Um, thank you, David, for the note on my mic. Let me know if that's a little better. We had 160 members, uh, started out random, 200 letters uh, to each constituency, and uh, then self-selection. You could go to a meeting, uh, have the workload explained to you, um, and then uh, random, if you were still committed to being part of the process, your name was drawn out of this big Dr. Seuss type hat. And so then our process was a, a 12 month process. We had a learning phase where we are learning about uh, BC and our voting history and our demographics. We are also learning about voting systems. And our outcome out of that phase was to identify what we thought the key values should be that would inform, uh, that would make the sort of ideal voting system for British Columbia. And then we went into a consultation phase and we um, were basically using that to test those key values like this is what this representative group of British Columbians thinks, have we got this right Are our values right. And so we had uh, 16 more than 1600 written uh, submissions that we read we had public meetings in every constituency across the province. We invited some people back to, to speak to the Citizens Assembly again. And in addition, this was the official stuff. Uh, we also had uh, members were out making presentations to their local community groups. We were in libraries and church basements and school gymnasiums presenting to rotaries and book clubs and, um, and sort of everything in between of, of citizen groups. And so we took all of that information back and came back into our deliberative phase and said, okay, first of all, are our, do our values still hold true? Are, do these core values that we think are gonna drive us, are they what we heard from the rest of British Columbia? And it was really interesting. This phase was, I think, the, the consultation phase was, I think, the most fascinating part of the whole experience for me because we've been told, we've always told, BC is the most polarized province. And what we heard was incredibly united across party lines, from urban to rural, from north to south, from young and old. We heard a very consistent belief that politics could be done better and a very consistent ideal of what better would look like. And so that led us into our deliberations phase where we looked at system design. We designed two systems, an MMP system and an STV system that met our key values. And I'll talk about those values in a second. And we designed them first. And then once we designed two systems that we could all live with, then we selected what system we are gonna recommend. And then we said, are we going to uh, recommend that this replace first past the post? And then the following part of that is of those 160, 127 of the alumni were involved in actively campaigning uh, for the, during the referendum, go, talking, being media spokespeople, making more presentations. And so this was a tremendous time commitment because of that, you know, the, they'd done a year and then added on another six months. So a couple of things in how we did our work that was important, I think. The focus was really on getting to yes. Um, and so what are, you know, rather than starting, you know, I always hear the devils in the details. So let's not start with the details. Let's start with those big underpinnings. So the, the values and principles. So we, you know, our values were fairness, our proportionality, you know, that um, people, the outcome should accurately represent how, uh, how people vote, that people wanted effective local representation, and they wanted greater voter choice. And so we had these core values that informed everything. And the second part of that was saying, 
nothing is decided until everything is decided. And so we didn't, people didn't have to sort of hold on to uh, something very personal about representation for their remote northern riding because they were worried if they didn't like fight everything at every level, they wouldn't get an impact to, they wouldn't get an opportunity to talk about that in one particular part of it. They could, we could make, we could make decisions knowing that if we came across things that fundamentally altered our beliefs, we could go back and revisit that. And we did this based on a, a very consensus based decision making right up until the end where we had to have official votes. We had no Roberts rules of order and we had multiple channels to contribute. And so we had the plenary, which were open to the public and the media. We had small group sessions. We had a very, very active online forum. I would go to bed at 11 o'clock at night and wake up the next morning and there'd be pages and pages of people's thoughts to, to read um, of what, what they'd been thinking about overnight. And our work would have happened both in public and in private. So it gave opportunities for everybody to participate in, um, in a certain way. Some of the people that the word never said a word in plenary were the um, shared the most in the online forum and would have tons of research from around the world and really help inform um, others who felt more comfortable speaking because they were coming back and saying, hey, have you thought about this? I'm seeing this here. You need to look at this study. So it, that really was important for how we did our work. We heard a lot of criticisms. It's a very bizarre experience to be involved in something um, that's studied by people for um, another 18 years. So we heard a lot um, of academics and politicians saying that we were led. Uh, we were led by um, our academic research leaders. We were led by leaders amongst us. We were uh, led by particularly influential people. And this really irritates me because it should irritate everybody because what when politicians and academics criticize citizens assemblies, what they're saying is voters are incapable. We don't believe they can have this thoughtful, deliberative, input and discussion without, you know, they, they couldn't have these complex thoughts without being told what to think. And I think this is really, you know, something that we need to continue to push back against because anything that undermines the role of the voter is a threat to democracy. And part of what um, I think led this is because people couldn't, you know, they could see the public, but there, like I said, there was a lot of stuff happening in small groups and online as well. And so when they saw something that they didn't understand, they would start to look back and say, well, what led to this? So the core example that people will cite for this was we chose to recommend STV as opposed to MMP. And they'll say, well, we must have been led. We must have, you know, it, there was... Uh, when the systems were presented, pros and cons were presented, and one of our research leaders said, you know, something negative about MMP, and that was it. In fact, what it was, was that we had been leaning towards MMP because proportionality was incredibly important to us. And the models we were seeing at the beginning suggested that um, MMP would deliver far more proportionality. As we started to get further into what we were building, and uh, we had, you know, we had experts in all sorts of areas, and we had someone who's very good at running simulations. And so they started running models and simulations to say, what would the STV model that we were building look like in terms of proportionality and BC? And when we saw that it would deliver equal proportionality to the MMP system we were building, that was a game changer for us. Because it said, if they both deliver equal proportionality, we can say what delivers better, uh, more effective local representation, and what delivers uh, greater voter choice, going back to our core values. And so we, um, and so that, you know, that was one of the key criticisms and something we'd have to think about in design of how to help people understand how we got to where we went. Another was a criticism was that we sidelined traditional activists and we didn't include politicians. The politicians, um, I agree with Graham around uh, the, the key role, it's not going to work unless we find a key role. Traditional activists, I think there's, you know, there's also a, a fair point, 
I would no longer be a good member of a citizens assembly on voting reform. I'm no longer an, an unbiased average member of the, the voting population. And I think there's an important role for traditional activists, but in order for the magic of citizens assemblies to work, we have to be okay with them not being the driving force and saying, just because you don't know the terminology and the formulas and can cite precedents doesn't mean your opinion on what politics should look like in your country should matter any less. It should matter equally. And you have valid input to say, even if you don't use the official terminology, even if you say broadly, this is what I want politics to look like. So I'm uh, conscious that I'm taking up too much time. So I'll try and um, uh, uh, wor work through this quickly. But um, we voted 80% to recommend STV uh, single transferable vote over mixed member proportionality. We voted 95% to recommend that uh, BC adopt single transferable vote. And in the 2005 referendum result, we, um, we had a double requirement. We, uh, we had a requirement that we had to pass by 60% of the voters, and we had to achieve a simple majority in 60% of the ridings. 57.69% uh, of voters voted to adopt a BCS TV, and 77 out of 79 ridings voted to 50% or more. Two important points here I want to make. In BC, since, the 19, since 1900, we've only once elected a government that had more support than STV did in 2005. Um, and then we have, I think, th three more times that we're over 50%. So we're not, um, we, we allow ourselves to be governed with less support than STV got. Um, and the 77 out of the 79 writings, it should not go unnoticed that the two writings that didn't pass a simple majority were the two, the only two writings where local newspapers came out against the citizens assembly process. So I talk about the importance of local community media and, um, and uh, people's uh, local understanding of the process. The same question went to, because it was over 50%, went to referendum in 2009, um, that time 39%. And then there was a 2019 referendum, which was a two-part question and uh, a, 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 a different question. So as Anita said, these are, you know, uniquely suited to where the usual power brokers have a vested interest. You know, we recognize that there's an inherent bias in allowing politicians to set the rules of how they're hired. They work because citizens are recognized as a trusted proxy. They, uh, people say, if I had gone through all of this, I trust that I would be able to make these decisions. And because I trust myself and my judgment, I trust that um, people like me would also do this. And we saw in the rolling polls that went throughout the referendum process that trust in the Citizens Assembly was very high. And that something like 75% of people said they'd heard personally and directly from a citizens assembly member, which was impossible, but it meant, you know, there was a lot of coverage in local newspapers. They knew someone who knew someone, they had gone to an event, they had a personal connection that they felt this was representative of their community. So, see, in terms of what I see as the conditions of success, obviously the preconditions matter, that pan-partisan belief that we had a problem in BC mattered. I think it's important to find a role for politicians. This is buying into the process. This is consultation in them as politicians, not just them as citizens, but it's also individually us working with them so they can see how they could be more effective as a, as a local representative. Uh, in, for example, a proportional system rather than um, in living with party discipline. We need them to see, you know, most people get into politics because of a belief they want to make their communities better. And so how can we, uh, how can we inspire this group to say, this will make your community better? 
we need educate a lot of education and um, coverage from the media, as we saw from Ontario, when it's operating in a vacuum, it's very hard. And if it's referendum based, it's a challenge when you have to decide, do you want change? And if you want change, what system in one referendum? It creates two barriers. So if, we if we're looking down a referendum model, I think we need to say, do we want to adopt a proportional system? But we need to let people know if they say yes, what comes next? Do we want to adopt a proportional system? And if yes, the means to choose to design that system is a citizens assembly. And then that passes, we have a citizens assembly and then say, do you want to adopt the system recommended by the citizens assembly? And a couple of last words. Um, the movement needs to be all in on this. We, uh, we would be in our 12th year of proportional elections in British Columbia if people hadn't have said, I like proportional representation, just not this flavor of proportional representation. I'll sit it out and I'll come back next. And this is a question I've asked each referendum of groups of people when we're organizing, are we all in? And people very quickly say, oh, well, we're all in if my flavor is chosen. It's, it's totally fine to say my, my threshold is it needs to be proportional. Absolutely. We would just aggravate the weaknesses of our current system if we went with uh, a ra ranked ballot single member plurality, uh, an alternative vote system. It's okay to say I want proportional to be my threshold, but once we get to proportional, we're not going to get this if we're not all in. You know, we're looking at two plus percent that made the difference, and those were the people who said MMP or bust, mixed member proportional or bust. So we go all in, we get it, and then we tweak. And the movement needs to be welcoming. You know, I, I was new once and then the next referendum I had people said, oh, I'm sick of having people, you know, who are new say, I'm sick of you citizens assembly people or you people who were here last time saying, oh, we tried this, it failed. And we need to find that balance between drawing on our knowledge of what's gone before and being open to new people and new ideas. And just going right back to um, what Anita said of the 1920 commission and looking at how long it took sort of franchise to expand to everyone. People think this is the early stages of this battle and it feels exhausting, but we're a hundred years into this. And so we're getting close to the end. And I really believe it's not a case of if, but when. And so this is really where we need to put a, a tremendous amount of energy into it. I, uh, my infant son sat on my desk at the Citizens Assembly in 2004. I went with him to vote for the first time uh, this fall. And so it has been his whole life. And, um, but I, I really, it feels a long time for me. I really believe we're getting there. So stick with it. Thank you. Thank you, Shoni. I really like the way you ended with the, you know, uh, it's not if, but when. And I think those of us who have been here a while need to hear that repeatedly, you know, and to, to carry us all along and capitalize on that new energy of new people coming in, you know, with the optimism and that kind of thing. So anyway, I really appreciate everything that you shared. I like the way you uh, look at the Citizens Assembly as a trusted proxy. I like that expression um, and that personal connection. Maybe we can come back to that in the Q&A about how we might be able to replicate that on a national level, because I think that that's really important, that feeling that it is somebody just like me, even to the point of I might know somebody who participated. So how to bring other people in is a theme that Graham also talked about. Um, and the third thing I just wanted to point out is where you were talking about um, helping politicians see that this is not a threat to them. This is something that can help them become more effective, more trusted uh, in their role. And I, I think that's a key takeaway from what you said as well. So thank you so much, Shoni, for everything uh, that you shared with us today. I'm going to introduce Michael now. Uh, so Michael Johns is a former associate professor and vice dean of arts at Laurentian University and currently a visiting professor at York University. His research and teaching interests include minority rights in the European Union and issues that impact levels of social cohesion, such as electoral systems. And I was delighted to 
sort of just meet Michael uh, for the first time about a month ago and found out that he facilitated groups at the Ontario Citizens Assembly for a whole year back in 2006. So it was just a delight to, uh, to find out that Michael is out there and to have him share his expertise. And I've asked him to talk about, uh, you know, the value of citizens assemblies, his experience on the Ontario Citizens Assembly, but also just to reflect on, again, what our other panelists have talked about, what needs to happen for one to succeed, particularly in Ontario right now, we are pushing really hard for a new Ontario Citizens Assembly on electoral reform, and what can we learn so that we are more successful next time. So I will turn this over to Michael. Thank you. And uh, it's great to, to talk to everybody today. Um, in, in terms of my role at the uh, Citizens Assembly in Ontario in, in 2007, I was a small group facilitator. There was uh, about, I think about 10 or 12 of us. Uh, some of them, the small group facilitators changed from the, uh, the first half of the Citizens Assembly through to the, uh, the to the end, but overall, I think there was about 12 to 14 of us at any one time. And uh, basically, we were uh, brought in due to our understanding of electoral systems. Uh, a lot of them were uh, graduate students uh, at the time. A few of us were professors. A few of, uh, were uh, um, college instructors and, and others who had a, a high level of uh, knowledge on electoral systems. And so uh, we were hired uh, to, to work with the citizens uh, during, uh, during, in particular, the first and the third stages. So the learning stage and uh, the deliberation stage. And uh, we all basically decided to, to uh, also be involved in um, the, the middle stage which was uh, when the, the members were hearing from the public in the consultation stage. And so, for example, uh, we would go to the meetings um, as, as much as we could if there were um, facilitators available. We would go and sit in as um, subject matter experts. And so if there was uh, questions that uh, the, the audience may have, about what the Citizens Assembly was doing or any particular aspect of a uh, electoral system, they, um, if, the, if the citizens themselves weren't comfortable answering, then we would be able to, uh, to step in. And so um, I think I did three of those meetings. Um, I did not participate in the infamous one, which was in Timmins in the middle of uh, the winter, where the uh, uh, Citizens Assembly members and, and uh, government staff who were helping them got stuck for about five days up in Timmins because the snow came in and they, they couldn't get out. Uh, and then um, the, the facilitators also helped uh, the Citizens Assembly members once the process had been completed and we were um, going into the information stage for the public. And uh, so uh, many of us gave public presentations. Uh, certainly the, the members of the Citizens Assembly were, were doing that in, in much higher numbers, but um, I spoke in Toronto, I spoke in Barrie, which is where I, I currently am. Uh, I spoke in Aurelia and across Simcoe County to, uh, to try to inform the public as much as possible of what the, the single, member, uh, single member plurality system um, was and uh, then what the alternative that was being proposed by the, the members of the Citizens Assembly, which was a mixed member proportional system. So that was the... Um, my interaction with the, the, the Citizens Assembly. So the Citizens Assembly in Ontario started in 2006. It was at, uh, it was the creation of the Ontario government and the uh, newly created and then very quickly abandoned uh, Ministry of Democratic Renewal, that there was a, a series of things that that ministry was to work on. And one of them was to look at electoral systems and electoral reform and building on uh, what Shani, Shani had talked about in British Columbia, basically trying to replicate uh, the British Columbia Citizens Assembly in Ontario. And so leading up to the Citizens Assembly, you had uh, letters sent out to the public at random, um, asking people, would you be interested potentially in, in 
sitting on a citizens assembly. They received about 12,000 responses. Of those, about 1,200 were uh, asked to attend meetings. Uh, they were then given sort of the full amount of time commitment that was going to uh, be required of them, which was um, over 12 weeks, six uh, weekends in uh, starting in September, plus the consultation stage. And then uh, starting in February, they would have another across 12 weeks, six uh, week, full weekends of deliberation. Uh, so every other week they would be required to be in Toronto. Um, and when people then would say, yes, I'd like to do this, or people who self-selected out, once that total number was, was given, um, they, I don't know if it was the same hat that uh, was used in BC, but uh, members were selected out of a hat. Uh, but by um, determining who they were, inviting, they did end up with a uh, remarkable cross-section of Ontario society. There were 103 members of the Citizens Assembly, 52 were women, 51 were men. Uh, the youngest member was 18 and had just become eligible to vote. Uh, the oldest member was over 80. Uh, there were uh, French speakers, um, there were uh, new Canadians, there were indigenous uh, Canadian, uh, indigenous population. So you had a, a real cross section of, of, the, uh, of the population. So what I'm going to focus on is what I saw as the, uh, as some, someone had, who observed the citizens assembly. Uh, I was obviously a part of the uh, facilitating crew, but I also got to watch the citizens do their work. Um, all of the work was done during the uh, learning phase and in the deliberations phase at uh, York University at Osgoode Hall, and uh, we all sat at the back and got to watch what was happening, and um, and then also stayed um, during the weekends with the Citizens Assembly members. So to see what worked and what didn't, I think, is a an important understanding of sort of the practical side to this. And then I'll, I'll end with a, a bit of a discussion about sort of what is necessary for a successful citizens assembly. So in terms of what worked well, um, I didn't start off for it to be as alliterative as it is, but it turned out there were three L's uh, <laughs> that uh, I think really were the, the factors for success. The first is logistics. Uh, it was a remarkable undertaking, and in many ways, it did require the the weight of the public service in Ontario. That um, there were a lot of resources that the Ontario government gave to the Citizens Assembly. A lot of people who were taken from different areas of the government uh, within the the civil service to to actually work on the logistics, because you know, Ontario was an enormous place, and you had one member from all of the different ridings at the time. And they all had to be in Toronto um, on Friday night. They all had to be home Sunday night. So the, uh, the work that went into ensuring that everyone who had to fly in was able to fly in, the people who were taking trains in, their trains were, uh, they had their train tickets that uh, people who were driving in had parking and were getting gas money, um, that everyone was housed at the, the a Holiday Inn in, in the north part of Toronto, uh, that there was food for everybody, that um, during the, 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 the process when we were at York University, lunch was always ready. Um, the, um, the snacks were ready, the, the buses were ready. That made an atmosphere of professionalism, that when the, the Citizens Assembly would come together in Toronto, it was time to work. And they knew that they had everything that they needed to, to do their job. And they took their job incredibly seriously. And one of, I think, the reasons is that they were in an environment which allowed them to just concentrate on what they needed to do. They very quickly learned that the, the logistics were gonna be taken care of. And that really matters um, in the mindset of people. You're asking people to give up every other weekend for 12 weeks, and then you're going to ask them to do it again. They, there needs to be a, a environment of success. 
And if you don't have that, people could get disgruntled very quickly. People might you know, not come to, to various meetings. And we did not see that in Ontario, that uh, the attendance of the members was in many weeks almost um, 100% uh, for many of the weeks. That's pretty remarkable when you consider that people have lives and things can happen and you know, you're asking a lot of, of citizens. Um, it kept people from being annoyed, which then again, keeps them on track, keeps them focused on their task um, and allowed them to, to remain positive that uh, they, they did feel not only was they were doing something important, but that they, they were contributing in, into what was happening in Ontario because they had these resources and they could see that um, the, the public service was working with them uh, to make sure that they, they were successful. So that's logistics. The second is leadership. Um, in terms of any sort of successful um, project of this size, you need somebody at, at the front of the room who uh, commands success, who has gravitas, who can keep things moving. And certainly they made a very smart decision in Ontario when they, they hired a, a former judge, George Thompson. Um, he was excellent at keeping people focused, people motivated, um, keeping the discussion on track. Um, he was able to uh, not just command the room by being at the front of the room, and he certainly did, uh, but he also took the time to get to know as many of the, the members of the Citizen Assembly as possible and would speak to them at lunch and would see them at different times and was able to connect with them uh, in a way that, again, establishes this commitment to the task and to keep everyone aware of what they were doing, that it was important, they were doing a good job, he was proud of them, and that they were they would follow what he wanted them to do, which, again, as a judge, he was very good at not leading them in any one particular direction other than forward. And that is something that um, I think really did matter in, in the success of getting from a bunch of strangers arriving in Toronto to people who uh, were working on this more than just during the time they were in Toronto, that there, those forums that uh, Shoni was talking about existed in, in the uh, Ontario Citizens Assembly as well. And they were working on all sorts of issues throughout the week and uh, the off week as well, uh, whether it was how do we improve um, youth engagement, how do we improve uh, women's representation, uh, how do we improve and make uh, more um, uh, minority uh, politicians electable, these sorts of things were all being discussed while they were also discussing questions of electoral reform. And I think all of that comes out of the um, uh, understanding of a mission. So logistics, leadership, and then learning. Um, this here was certainly driven by uh, a professor from Queen's University, Jonathan Rose. Uh, he was in charge of getting the members of the Citizens Assembly up to speed on uh, electoral systems. And that is a pretty daunting task. Um, one of the things that, that happens with electoral systems is you can make it as really simple as you want by saying, well, there are some systems in which a plurality of people get elected. There's some systems where you need a majority to win and some which are proportional. Or you can get really, really into the weeds. Um, and in some cases, you do need to go a little bit into the details because uh, it does matter. Some of the decision making you have to make about some of these different electoral systems. And he really walked a fine line of introducing the systems letting people understand what it would look like to vote in different ways, and then introducing enough of the um, nuance so that they could then, when they get into the deliberation stage, speak the language of electoral reform effectively. Uh, there were opportunities for questions. There was time to learn. They gave the citizens enough time to learn. Um, and here, and you know, certainly not to, to you know, blow their own, my own horn here, but certainly the small group facilitators actually played a really important role here. Um, because part of the job was there would be a learning 
period where everyone was together. And then the uh, you would go into these smaller groups and with about groups of about 20 and two small group facilitators and we'd work on issues. Uh, but that was only one part of what we ended up doing that because um, we were with the citizens um, where we stayed in the hotel with them, we ate lunch with them, uh, we had these small groups with them, they got to know us very well. And with they didn't want, you know, certain, you don't want to put your hand up in, in amongst 103 people and say, I don't understand something. They had the ability to come talk to us. And whether it was over lunch or back at the hotel or whenever, we could sit down and walk through things that they were struggling with and, and make sure that they felt comfortable with the material because they were going to have to deliberate uh, about it. Um, my, I actually worked, the, I mentioned that we had um, members who were between 18 and, and 80. Well, the oldest member um, of the Citizens Assembly came to me one, one day and his, he was really concerned about the amount of math that might be involved in one of the, the systems. And he was like, I haven't done math in 80 years uh, or 70 years. I, I'm really concerned. And so, you know, he and I sat at lunch and I went through and, you know, you don't need to know this amount of math, but here's the math you do need to know. And we'll walk through it, you and I, and you know, if you don't get it tomorrow, we'll do it again. And that sort of relationship I had with that gentleman was happening with all of the small group facilitators with the various members. So again, it all comes around to sort of creating an environment of success. And that involves comfort, both from a logistical point of view and from a learning point of view. So all of that I think, really worked well. And um, there were some things that were a little less effective. And uh, I, I do think these are sort of warning signs for any sort of citizens assembly, whether it is on electoral reform or any of the other issues um, that is that we're now seeing citizens assemblies um, tackle around the world. Um, this one may get me into some trouble with Shoni based on her presentation, but uh, the outside influence of uh, other people trying to influence the, the members, I think did happen. Uh, she may disagree. I watched it happen at least in Ontario. Um, and in particular, this happened during the deliberative stage uh, because what ends up happening in, a, in, in any sort of citizens assembly is the people who are really invested in those issues are going to be um, engaged and try to get their point of view across. And so there was a lot of attempts to influence the members, whether it was by providing alternative systems or uh, academics making, you know, examining what they were working on and, and predicting how it would go. And eventually that ends up taking a, a real life of its own. Um, and we end up in Ontario, one of the weirdest things that happened, and it really derailed part of the deliberative stage, was the citizens were working on a, a mixed member proportional system. And one of the things that, um, for those of you who aren't overly familiar with that system, which is the system used in Germany and New Zealand, uh, one of the decisions you have to make is whether you have overhang seats, which basically means does the size of your legislature get bigger or smaller from election to election, an election to an election, depending on how much proportionality you want. And a professor um, was looking at what the Citizens Assembly had come up with and came up with a, a possibility that you could have this enormous legislature, uh, depending on how the vote turnout took place. It was a really unlikely scenario, but the members got stuck on that because they were really scared about making a mistake. They were designing something they wanted to be proud of. They wanted to design something they could all agree on. They wanted to design something that could win a, a referendum if they went that down that road. And all of a sudden they get this, in, this information from an academic saying, what you've designed has a huge flaw in it. Well, it all electoral systems have big flaws in them. Um, and in this unlikely scenario, yeah, that could have happened. But that sort of influence uh, really took the discussion in a, in a very strange way. And it did change the system they ended up designing, um, probably to its detriment. Um, and so I don't know how you could have solved that other than maybe allowing for the members to have um, collectively more of an in-camera session every once in a while, still ensuring transparency afterwards, 
but some times where they could discuss things um, without uh, people being fully aware of what they're doing at that moment um, might have been good to give them some, some time to discuss some things without some of that outside influence. Um, Michael, I'm going to ask you to wrap up in a couple minutes so we have time left for questions. We sort of got ourselves a little bit over time on this uh, webinar through no fault of yours. Yes. Um, so uh, second would be difficult members. There were some, you know, as a citizens assembly, you get a variety of people. You have different citizens. Some citizens are more cooperative than others. And um, that was a problem. There was a uh, a few cases in which you had people who were very disruptive. Um, they shut some people down. Some people who probably had some really good ideas didn't want to engage because they didn't want to deal with certain members. And so that is just something where you have to be aware of that you, when you bring citizens together, like any group of people, there is going to be conflicts. And some of those conflicts cannot be solved because of the personality of the person you're dealing with. Um, and then the last is just simply awareness. Um, as I said, the people who were interested in electoral reform were very interested in the process. The public was generally less aware of the entire process. And when you end up in um, into a referendum, it was a surprise to some people simply because it didn't get the attention that it, that it needed outside of the uh, invested people. So I guess I'll, I'll wrap up there. Um, other than just to say that you know, there are these are the things that you need to do from a practical point of view that they're, you know, in terms of what is a successful citizens assembly, I'm, I actually, a citizens assembly that comes to any sort of conclusion, whether it's one that as an earlier speaker mentioned, whether it's one that you agree with or not, that's a successful uh, citizen assembly is one that meets, deliberates and concludes. Ideally, the public then goes with them. But in terms of a citizens assembly coming together and, and making recommendations for policies, that to me, it would be success. So it doesn't have to be perfect um, and it's not going to be perfect, but it is an excellent tool to, to drive public policy. So I will end there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Michael. I really appreciated that. Uh, in uh, you know, in uh, insider up close look at the Ontario Citizens Assembly, I'm sure there's always, you know, some of us who wonder what was it really like, and you know, and you were there, and Shoni was there, so that experience is just uh, is terrific. And I also liked you talking about an environment of success, um, setting it up for success. And I think that Graham's sort of been talking about the bigger picture about politically how to set it up for success, and you've been talking about how to set it up for success within the assembly, and we need uh, both for sure. So I want to invite our panelists to turn their webcams back on so we can take some questions. And I want to say that I'm sorry we've run a fair bit over time with the presentations from what I had planned and usually I'm quite a bit better than this, but anyway, that's okay. Uh, so I'm going to let everybody who's attending know that uh, I'm and our panelists if they could stay an extra 10 minutes. So that would be put us at 340, uh, 40 minutes after whatever hour it is wherever you are. Um, okay, cool. So we can take a few more questions. And we actually got so many uh, amazing questions that I don't usually have this problem. Everybody is totally on topic. So I'm going to just pick a few of them out of here. And apologies to those of you who don't get your question answered. You can always email afterward. And I can always um, ask the appropriate person to try to get an answer uh, for you. So Rob asks something uh, that I think all of us are wondering, and I hear a lot, how much influence do citizens assemblies normally have? So this is the question of, you know, our people often ask, like, can it be binding on the government or is it just advisory? Uh, so this is more, I think, around the political question. And maybe, um, maybe I'll ask Graham to address that one, if you sure. don't mind. Um, effectiveness ranges from 100% if you've worked with uh, the legislative and executive powers uh, to 0% if you just want to go off and produce a nice report. And 
some of them are uh, sort of in between uh, anything from one to 100 uh, percent. So it's a rather crude uh, pointer to the fact that the more you work with trying to get change that you know can be acceptable, but pushes the boundary as far as possible with government, uh, the more you're showing that you're actually serious about getting something done rather than just posturing and saying, ideally, we'd like this and we have the perfect answer. And government then has says, well, you, you didn't even involve us. You didn't even talk to us about it. So that's what I mean by the hard politics, because I was one of those people who used to write beautiful reports uh, suggesting how we did stuff and not engaging with the government at all. That was very personally satisfying um, until I came to throw away several hundred copies that never went anywhere. The harder stuff, and more seriously, the political skill, is to get people engaged, get them interested, make sure they don't feel threatened. There are many members of Parliament in the UK who say to me, aren't we the Citizens' Assembly in Parliament? I said, no. Um, I've been a member of Parliament, and actually we could do a lot more. And if citizens supported us and we them, we'd get a lot more done working together. Oh, and they suddenly see citizens' assemblies as a liberating and very progressive force in getting stuff done rather than some sort of threat and people are trying to take our jobs away. So uh, that's why being extremely impatient by personality, I've had to learn patience and bring people along with you, even when they start off by saying, we don't actually see that there's anything wrong anyway in the way we're running society. So it's, it's a long job, but it really is worth it because otherwise you can spend a whole lifetime writing lovely reports and you haven't made actually any serious change in the way we run our affairs. And you're setting your society up to become an autocracy. Graham, if I can just dig in a little tiny bit more to that, are you oh. are you talking? Um, okay, I understand the idea of getting the politician buy in for deliberative processes. Does that follow through with an agreed upon mandate for a citizens assembly and agreed upon process for what happens after a citizens assembly? Um, I think if you are, as probably most of us are, trying to push this along as far and as fast as possible then uh, you will keep bargaining and government will keep asking questions in anxiety about what might go wrong here. And you need to reassure them that actually lots can go right when you get citizens behind you. And everyone, and above all myself, go back to the uh, situation in Ireland where the politicians had been petrified like a prehistoric forest actually rigid, unable to move on the issues around abortion and a number of other ones, uh, and just were afraid even to mention the issue. It took a group of 100 citizens to unlock this dam that had built up over 60 years and actually come up with something that went through a committee in the parliament, as well as the citizens' assembly process, went through a committee in the parliament went through the pond itself, got the okay from the government, and then was finally passed by a referendum of all people. So citizens can be the key to unlock, the process key to unlock change when uh, members of parliament, for example, are, as you said earlier, whipped into blocks. They don't all think in blocks, but they're made to vote in blocks like robots rather than interact with the process and not be present and running it, but actually observing it and feeling reassured about it and seeing progress from ordinary people coming up with sensible ways forward. So it's you need to take the time to say to people, to say, put all in politics, that this is actually going to be a helpful thing, not something you need to worry about. But if you are worried, tell us what your worry is and we will meet it because like them, I was one of them, they all joined parliament or the legislature to do good works. 
uh, as Shoni said earlier on. And if you want to give 12 weekends of your time, as Michael just mentioned, um, you want to do good too. That's why you're doing it. You could be at home with your family. So let's get these two blocks of good people to actually work together and find ways. It won't always be the same way forward, but there is now a sort of set of ways to do this, which you can choose from the way that works best for you and your legislature and your circumstances. So the methodology is getting there now. And it's sometimes just we have to let go of our previous positions and say, getting progress on this is more important than waiting forever for the perfect answer. 100%. All right. I wanted to take a question from uh, Larry Gordon, who's on here. Larry was our very, Shoni smiling, she knows who Larry Gordon is, our very first executive director and co-founder of Fairville Canada. So I'm glad to see him on this webinar. Um, he's saying great presentations. I think Shoni and Michael, um, okay, it's hard to flip through this chat box, um, had positive experience with citizen deliberation but he's saying that that was a long time ago in the stone age of social media. <laughs> um, and I think it's hard for me to see this whole question. One sec. Uh, I think Anita, the question is- Do you see it? Like how, um, how, how can we get the members yeah. to be still focused on the deliberations and you know, social it's media can really, derail a lot of things can be toxic can be influential etc so yeah it's how, that whole question too of how do you yeah. connect it that we've been struggling with is how do you connect what's happening with 100 or 150 people with 30 million people across the country how do you engage and how do you overcome the negative effects and positive effects of social media that didn't exist 20 years ago so I think our communications department, uh, the, the communications people on the Citizens Assembly were an incredible part of its success because they were getting out, talking to the media. Every local paper had an account of each meeting and what was happening. They were getting us interviews with the media. That was really important. And I think the same attention would need to be paid by the Citizens Assembly mechanism to social media this time. We all had media training. We'd also need social media training for those that don't. I spend my day job getting people to donate lots of money to puppies and kittens on social media. I know the power of using it um, for evil and for good. And I think we would just need to be, you know, it is a tool to make people feel like they have a personal connection that they have personally hurt. We would have to be very, um, dedicate a lot of resources to using it for our benefit because we know that it will be used for um, lies and misleading and and toxicity. So we so I, I think it's we have to recognize the force that it is and actively and actively use it because I think it does have a great potential of bringing together communities of people who can hear straight from members what their experience is and feel more than ever that it is a citizen by proxy. Graham, did you have something yeah. you looked like you were? Yeah, um, social media or anti-social media, depending on your view, um, is a very serious issue. Why not have a citizens convention on that at national level? Uh, because it's clear that the conventional representative democracy is finding it incredibly difficult to deal with it. They're finding it hard to regulate it and put uh, global law in place. So why not follow the example that we've set up on climate change, where there have been dozens, hundreds of citizens' assemblies on climate change at local level in particular, but also at national level. Now there is a uniform uh, pulling together of some of that through the global climate change citizens convention. So why can't we have a sensible discussion on uh, social media also about how that is regulated so that it doesn't have some of the downsides that you're referring to? Rather than saying that's the reason we're paralyzed and can't do anything, we say, no, oh, it's a really serious issue. Let's see uh, what the ways forward uh, can be and change 
use social use citizens assemblies as a tool within our evolved democracy where those things that our representatives can't really speak to because of the whipping system because of the funding of politics because of the influence of social media they find that difficult let the people in on the secret and you know what like in so many other issues they will come up with some really smart sensible answers or just just on the sort of oh we we uh this has all took place before social media came on on stream i can guarantee uh to to larry was it that uh there are more now there are more citizens assemblies and conventions taking place than ever before they are of a much higher level of integrity impartiality and competence than the pioneers as you'd expect uh so don't worry about there not being enough people out there caring about things like climate change like the impact of social media like the attack on our democracy so um the more the more that we get going the better and getting that what works organization so anyone listening to this can absorb the best practice and set up their own citizens assembly is a smart way to go hey i wanted to sort of follow up on that uh and direct a question to michael to start first so and this is a question we get quite a bit actually if people are starting to understand how the citizens get picked and how that's a trustworthy random representative process, but then they get a little bit stuck on how do the experts and facilitators get picked. So somebody is asking, where should facilitators for citizens assemblies be sourced? Um, drawing from the plentiful pool of talent within the public sector can present conflicts of interest. So they're saying who picks the experts? And this comes from, honestly, the deep level of distrust in politicians in Canada and in many other countries, they are afraid that experts will be somehow handpicked by the politicians to arrive at a predetermined outcome. So who can address that? I'll start with Michael, then go over to the other two guests. Well, I think it also depends on what you want the facilitators to do. Um, you know, and one of the things that happened in Ontario is the same facilitators who were the learning subject experts were then also helping with the deliberative side. And while it was great because you know I was getting paid for both things, I certainly was much better qualified for the first than I was for the second. Um, there are experts out there, and uh, you know there are people who are trained in getting people to decision making. Uh, there is people who are trained in in certain subjects. Um, I think the the main thing with all of it is just transparency. That um, you know fear of not just politicians, the sort of the reaction to expertise that has been happening recently is a concern. But if you, you know, our qualifications as facilitators were public to the to, to the members. They knew who we were, they know where we came from, we knew they knew who hired us. Um, so that is available. And then then it falls to the facilitators to to ensure that trust that you, you know, you do a good job, you are open, you have to, you know, not lead them in certain directions, your job is to provide information or help them make their own decisions. You know, if the training is done properly by the facilitators, if the facilitators themselves are properly trained, and then they do their jobs, then they are simply a tool. It doesn't matter where they come from. It's just that they are the conduit to allow the citizens to do their job. I'd love Tony? to... To add to that, um, I think it's you know it's very important to build in that the staffing is not a politically led process. That you choose your trusted leader, your your retired judge. We had Jack Blaney, uh, a university retired university president. You know you have that person, and they staff up the citizens assembly. So it's not political appointments. I think one of the things that I really appreciated was in addition to. Um, in addition to those hired to do that, we also as members had the opportunity to say, hey, we would like to hear more about X. And here's three or four people we've identified that we think are writing and um, researching this in Canada. Can one of them come in and speak to us? So building in that opportunity for members to add content as well, really, um, really does matter. 
So I would uh, say there are now loads and loads of great service providers out there. They're conventional, straight down the line, business people. Uh, that's their job. And that's how they make their money. Uh, they would never be employed again if they twisted this so that a particular outcome happened. And by the way, if you are interested in proportional representation, the quickest way to kill it off and the quickest way to also, as a collateral damage, kill off citizens' assemblies is to corrupt or fix a citizens' assembly to produce the result that you want. So no one is that stupid. We all want a proper outcome. And look, if it's not quite what we wanted, that's what the people have decided. You know, uh, if we want to, if we want the purity of living at the top of the mountain, off you go. But um, we actually want to make some progress here. We may not get everything that we want. So um, I think we should always value. I mean, it's the thing that people don't like about conventional politics, conventional representative politics, is that it can be fiddled, it can be gamed. It can be corrupted by money, for example, if we should do everything possible to make sure that never happens in citizens' assemblies and conventions. And if we do that, we will be giving people that wonderful superpower of being able to make some influence on their decisions, even if it's not absolutely perfectly what they would have chosen to write on a piece of paper themselves. I just want to reinforce as we, am I echoing? Am I still echoing? Okay, that was weird. Okay, uh, I just want to reinforce what uh, Graham was saying. You know, uh, for those of you who are new to Fair Vote or just joining us in terms of citizens assemblies, one of the things that Fair Vote Canada is recommending for a citizens assembly on electoral reform, um, you know, maybe there would be even one on democratic renewal more broadly, uh, is that it consider all options. So this is something that the BC citizens assembly had, they were not told uh, ahead of time what to come up with. They could have recommended keeping first past the post. They could have recommended the alternative vote. So just because, and so Fair Vote Canada is advocating um, it's open-ended, it's up to the citizens, and if it doesn't come out with what we as an advocacy group for PR want, well, we're will, quite willing to take that risk uh, on this topic. And, you know, so we recognize the difference between obviously an independent citizens assembly that is needs to build the trust that Graham and Michael and Shoney have talked about and an advocacy group with a specific position. Those need to be quite far apart. And uh, as uh, Graham was saying, you know, neutral independent orgs who do nothing but facilitate deliberate processes you know will be a key part in deciding who the facilitators are they have no skin in the game um, and they will help select those people and the other thing that shoni said that was so important is the power of the citizens assembly to say we want to hear from this person we want to hear from this person we want this person to come back and talk to us because we want to hear more from them and that's where the citizens assembly the independence of the citizens assembly is important so it's very hard if not impossible to to game the assembly as so that's important as well to building trust so it is 3 40 and uh everybody has been with us for uh, an hour and 40 minutes, which is sort of amazing. And I wanted to thank all the people that came out today <laughs> uh, for this. And we hope that this is uh, our project in Canada is part of the connected to what's going on in the UK, which is connected to what's going on globally in an effort to evolve our democracy, as Graham said. So I appreciate everyone coming out and each of the guests. Thanks for taking your time. If you somehow got in this webinar and you're not on the Fair Vote Canada mailing list and you'd like to keep up with our campaign for PR and for a National Citizens Assembly on electoral reform and citizens assemblies in Ontario and across the country, you can uh, sign our Declaration of Voters' Rights, fairvote.ca slash declaration. And I hope to see all of you um, and more next week for our webinar on the alternative vote. Okay.